So the next paper is by Ai Wei, who hates me for having forced him to present it. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> right, I'm not going to repeat it so many times. I mentioned to some of you already that uh, I committed to this conference uh, two weeks before my baby was born. Uh, so I basically did most of the work in the last three days, uh, you know, with a two-month-old crying and waking up constantly. Uh, this is John's work with uh, Taiji Furusawa, who is sitting here, flying all the way from Tokyo to join us, uh, and also Keiko Ito from Sanshu and Tomohiko Inu uh, from Riati. Uh, so let me say a few words about uh, the stage of uh, the stage of research in global value chains, uh, and a lot of the points are going to echo uh, what Andy Bernard said yesterday. Um, so a lot of interesting work has been done, and uh, we learn a lot about global value chains, in particular the international segment, uh, thanks to the new data, uh, such as the world input output tables, and you know all sort of. Uh, data sets provided by uh, different statistical agencies. But I think we don't know as much about the sort of the domestic segments of global value chains. And obviously the main reason is because, you know, we don't have the data uh, telling us, you know, who is connected to who uh, within a country and who is trading with who and how sort of global sourcing affects uh, buy and seller relationships. Uh, but as Andy has uh, told you, there have been, you know, several countries like Belgium, Japan, and increasingly other countries that sort of share this kind of information with researchers allow us to think about, uh, you know, long-term relationships between buyers and sellers within an economy, and more importantly, how sort of global sourcing and domestic sourcing, domestic sourcing can be substitutes or complements, and how sort of they evolve and interact over time. All right. So by and large, this is a paper about, you know, how global sourcing affects domestic sourcing in Japan. Um, uh, there are two parts uh, of the paper, or actually the paper doesn't exist. You know, the one that you saw in the USB drive is so preliminary that you can just ignore it. It was a paper that was submitted, let me say. And otherwise, they <laughs> make me, uh, my reputation as an old. Yeah, but a lot, I mean, uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm sure you read it too. And <laughs> uh, well, there are a lot of results. <laughs> And uh, there are a lot of results that just came out in the last three days, put it this way, so, which are not included in the paper. Uh, so, but the paper did provide you some idea about what I'm going to say. Uh, uh, there are two parts in the research. Uh, the first part is theory. Uh, I'm going to spend only about five to ten minutes talking about the theory uh, because it's built largely on uh, Andres, uh, Fort, and Tintenort. Uh, wonderful work uh, about you know, global sourcing. And, of course, we look at domestic sourcing as well. Uh, you know, similar idea has been extended uh, by Bernard Mosnes and Sato, also looking at Japan. Uh, but uh, the paper by Bernard and co-authors uh, focus on domestic sourcing and how sort of infrastructure investment affect uh, buyer and seller relationships. So in a very sort of strategic sense, you know, you can see my paper as sort of combining the two, you know, thinking about global sourcing and domestic sourcing at the same time. But I want to highlight one thing which is uh, very important in my opinion, and it has been sort of ignored uh, 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 in my opinion, again, you know, by trade economists, which is, you know, a dimension of uh, productivity or performance that is not captured by the standard uh, way of measuring productivity, right? So when we take sort of the Mattis model, it's about efficiency. Firms that are productive are going to, you know, buy more and source more uh, internationally and also domestically. Uh, and at the same time, you know, say there's some sort of fixed cost of, trade either for import and export. So therefore, you know, the interaction between sort of the traditional sense of productivity and uh, 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 trade costs is going to give us, you know, some sort of productivity and geographic sorting of import and export. Uh, but uh, there's a paper, uh, and I believe this is not the only one, uh, by Tom Holmes and, and Roberts, you know, showing uh, this idea of sort of alternative distribution of firm size. And something that is probably important for Japan and uh, 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 in uh, particular sectors, that sort of long-term relationship, repeated interactions that have been emphasized in the previous talk is also important in sort of shaping relationships between buyers and sellers, and at the same time affect how trade and global sourcing will affect sort of domestic uh, trade relationships. So this is the dimension that, that we are going to push. Um, 
uh, just to fix idea, I'm going to call this sort of relationship specificity between buyers and sellers in the relationship. Uh, when you see the results, both theory and the empirical parts of the paper, you may have some other idea about, you know, what kind of uh, specificity or relationship that we are actually talking about, right? So I don't want to commit myself to relationship specificity at this point, uh, but since this idea is well known in the literature, uh, I'm just going to be sort of lazy and rely on that concept, which captures at least some of the uh, uh, patterns that are observed in the empirical parts of the paper, all right? Um, so uh, the second part of the paper is to use uh, this uh, extensive uh, and unique uh, network data in Japan, which captures uh, 4.5 million buyer and seller relationships uh, uh, for two years, uh, 2005 and 2010. Um, and we merge this network data with trade data uh, at the firm level uh, uh, and look at you know, how uh, offshoring affects uh, buyer and seller relationships. Uh, so bear in mind, since we only have two years of the data, so there are lots of sort of time series changes and uh, interesting uh, evolution that you know maybe Andy Bernard would be able to look at for Belgium, which we can we, which we cannot do uh, uh, for Japan. But one thing that has happened in the last week is we find an instrument uh, that somehow works to proxy uh, for firms offshoring. So in a certain sense, we will. If you believe in the instrument, we have something to say about the causal effect of offshoring on domestic sourcing, right? Uh, which is something that Andy was probably thinking about. Uh, 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 hopefully, that will sort of shed some light for uh, other people's research as well. Um, uh, in the interest, interest of time, I'm just going to preview the results uh, 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 very briefly. Uh, given that uh, uh, our model is built on uh, authors and co-authors, uh, so it is not surprising to see that uh, there will be productivity sorting in the sense that uh, more productive firms are more likely to offshore. Uh, and at the same time, because of the ability to find cheaper and better foreign suppliers uh, after offshoring, uh, the marginal cost of production will decrease. So therefore, the measure productivity of the firm after offshoring is going to increase. Um, and uh, as a result, offshoring uh, due to this positive productivity effect, is going to uh, induce uh, offshoring firms to also increase uh, their geographic scope uh, of uh, outsourcing. Uh, the second part, uh, which is you know, our own contribution, uh, is that you know, we show relationship specificity of the input is actually quite important in affecting this uh, sorting pattern. Uh, first of all, firms are less likely to source to a distant supplier for relationship-specific inputs, all right, which may not be surprising. Uh, uh, you, know, you may think about face-to-face -face interaction. You may think about monitoring. And if long distance is going to uh, make face-to-face -face interaction and mon monitoring more difficult, you, know, you got the idea. This is basically what we have in the model to sort of uh, create sort of this interaction between distance of sourcing and relationship specificity of input. Uh, for the same reason, we also find that firms are less likely to offshore uh, relation-specific uh, inputs. Uh, if you think about you know, offshoring relationship between Japan and China, you know, Japanese, Japanese firms uh, you know, will keep a lot of this relationship-specific production at home and outsource a lot of this generic and mass production to China. Um, and the last part of the paper, we are able to say something about how offshoring affects productivity and also domestic sourcing patterns. Uh, offshoring is going to create uh, churning uh, of domestic buyers and suppliers. Uh, but interestingly, we find a negative net effect on the number of suppliers that the firm will use after offshoring. So I'm going to say a few words about that, you know, why we have this effect that sort of offsets the positive productivity effect that I mentioned earlier. Yes. Hi. So you, among the choices you have, you can outsource domestically, you can offshore, but you can also produce within... Uh, again, the boundaries of the firm uh, in the plants that you can you know, locate wherever in Japan. So yes. So in also... the model, we have insourcing. Uh, in the data, we have some idea about how to test it, but we didn't get to that part yet. But when I talk about the empirical results, please uh, talk about this again. Uh, and uh, the second part, which echoes, uh, the second finding about the effects of offshoring, which echoes uh, you know, uh, our emphasis on specificity, is that... Uh, Offshoring firms are more likely to drop suppliers that produce generic input, uh, but they are 
uh, a lot more likely to ask suppliers that produce uh, relationship-specific input. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, a natural consequence of that is, you know, the choices of suppliers after offshoring is going to be those that are closer to the buyer. So in some sense, we find something that has been mentioned a lot by people at the W2 and others, which is we have this sort of regionalization or localization of trade, but that is observed within Japan, right? So, you know, you offshore a lot of stuff to China, you keep the closer suppliers in Japan, and actually this sort of proximity or agglomeration is strengthened uh, as a result of offshoring. So that is an uh, implication of uh, some of our results. All right, so I'm going to skip the literature. Uh, there are lots of you know, well-known economists who have done work on networks and uh, global sourcing. Uh, the paper that needs some advertisement is the one I wrote with Key, <laughs> which shows that uh, oh, Key doesn't need advertisement, I do, uh, which shows that uh, Chinese firms actually uh, increasing their domestic sourcing as a result of uh, trade liberalization. Uh, and that is a reason why you know, uh, Chinese exports have uh, uh, experienced this sort of moving up the value chain phenomena. All right, uh, as I have promised, I will spend five minutes, maybe six, on the model uh, power. If I uh, use more than that, stop me right away. Uh, the demand side of the model is standard. Uh, we have varieties. Uh, we have differentiated products produced by monopolistically competitive firms. Uh, there's no export. Uh, when a firm produces uh, final goods, uh, it uses intermediate inputs. Uh, there's no labor. So if you want to think about labor being used for production, the labor are used in-house to produce intermediate inputs that are used uh, in, in the final production stage. Uh, the firms can obviously outsource uh, production to domestic regions uh, and also foreign regions. Um, uh, and there are M domestic regions and M star foreign regions. Uh, to outsource to those regions, firms have to pay fixed cost per region uh, to find a potential uh, good supplier. Right? So you may pay a fixed cost, and at the end you couldn't find a good one in that region, but that is sort of you know, a sunk cost in that sense. I mean, our model is static, and the empirical results only have two years of data. So, you know, to think about sunk and fixed costs is not uh, that interesting. But, you know, imagine that you pay a sunk cost to find a supplier, but at the end, you couldn't find a good one in the region. Uh, but this is something that, you know, firms have to consider uh, uh, ex ante uh, to, to, uh, before they search for uh, a supplier. Uh, I'm always a bit confused, so just clarifying. When you say offshoring, you mean global sourcing. There's no actually FDI involved. It's not the, because I always think of offshoring as you relocating your production, but you're thinking just global. I'm, I'm buying from foreign suppliers, so I'm sourcing it just yeah. personal language. So you're, there's no FDI involved. There's no usually. FDI involved. And it's like in their model. I'm going to buy from foreign suppliers, yeah. whether it's within firm boundaries or not, you don't care. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I, when I use say offshoring, I mean global sourcing in this paper. We have some data on FDI, but we haven't used it uh, for this paper yet. But obviously, this is a relevant question that when Japanese firms outsource to China, a lot of time, you know, it's sort of within firm uh, boundary. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we extended uh, uh, Unters et al. model by thinking about multiple inputs. Uh, I mean, you know, you can think of the production process as uh, uh, involving uh, two stages. You know, the first stage is you know, basically producing intermediate uh, varieties, and the second stage is to uh, aggregate the varieties to intermediate composites, uh, and then the final stage is assembly, you know, which is to put all these composites together to produce a final good using a Cobb Douglas uh, production technology. Uh, so, uh, as a result, you can think of sourcing as uh, a sector-specific decision, right? The firm that needs, you know, five different kinds of uh, intermediate input, you know, they may outsource in one particular sector, but not in other sectors. Uh, and within that sector, we will have something to say about, you know, from which regions uh, within Japan that the firm is going to outsource. There are three costs uh, uh, to find a supplier, and at the same time, you know, conditional on finding a good match, uh, shipping the intermediate input back to uh, the headquarter will require some iceberg trade cost, and iceberg trade cost is naturally increasing in distance. Um, 
uh, this is also new. Uh, in addition to sort of the multi-input sector extension, we also in include this uh, part that requires buyers to invest in communication with the supplier. All right. Uh, this is a way that we model relationship specificity. Uh, you may not like it if you have, you know, s something like hold up or you know asset specificity in mind. We don't have that. It's really about you know how much you invest in communicating with uh, the supplier in Japan. Um, the way that we uh, capture this dynamics or interactions uh, 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 in a reduced form is you know the buyer can invest uh, Q. Uh, you know, which is going to be clear in terms of what unit, you know, Q amount of communication uh, intensity uh, to talk to the supplier. Uh, and, you know, there, and Q is going to affect the probability of successful production of intermediates, right? So if you invest in Q, there's a probability Q that uh, good intermediate will be produced by the supplier that you found uh, with probably, probability one minus Q, uh, the intermediate inputs are so lousy that it's sort of useless uh, for the bias production, All right? Um, and um, uh, communication investment is going to increase uh, the unit cost of production, or you can think of that as some sort of additional iceberg cost. Iceberg cost is fixed, but uh, you know this communication is going to be chosen, and it is going to endogenously uh, uh, affected by uh, you know the importance of uh, investing in that relationship, and at the same time, you know how far away the supply and the buyer is. Um, so, you know, if the supply and the buyer is are farther away, then, you know, this, uh, 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 the cost of, the marginal cost of investment in communication is going to be higher, All right? You know, imagine you have to fly to uh, uh, California every day to talk to someone that is sort of the marginal cost we have in mind in terms of communication. Just to clarify, the supplier wants to produce high quality. He might just not get the idea. Yeah. So this is the dimension of specificity we try to capture, right? The goods are very complex. It's very hard to describe. You have to talk about it, you know, 10 times before. So they want the to work clear. together, but it's hard. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, you know, let me sort of highlight a few equations uh, uh, before I move to the empirical part. So the marginal cost of production is going to uh, be a CES aggregate of all the lowest cost of intermediate that uh, the buyer will be able to find in the domestic economy as well as in foreign countries. Uh, there's a part about uh, insourcing, right, which is captured by, uh, you know, IK0, right? IK0 is, you know, uh, how many of the intermediate varieties that you decide to produce in-house, uh, which uh, may or may not require additional fixed cost. Um, but then, you know, the firm is going to find, is going to, you know, uh, consider multiple domestic regions for outsourcing uh, after paying the fixed cost. And, you know, if the firm is able to find, you know, the lowest cost supply in that region, then, you know, that firm is going to contribute that variety uh, to the final good producer. All right. So CKJ is basically uh, the lowest price that the firm is able to get uh, for input K of variety J produced by supplier J. Um, so we, we make the assumption, uh, simplifying assumption following, you know, many people that, you know, the supplier is going to draw productivity from a fresh distribution. And the beauty of doing that is, you know, we are able to write down very uh, simple closed form solutions about the share of outsourcing from different regions in different sectors uh, used by the buyer. All right. Um, in the empirical part of the paper, we actually don't have information about the shares of input, but we have, you know, information about the probability that the firm is going to use inputs from a particular region and in a particular sector. Yes, yes, so I, I skipped that. So it's very eat and cotton in the sense that the upstream sectors are perfectly competitive. Yeah. Okay. No, there's, there's no learning spillover. Uh, we can talk about that. Yeah, each firm is SF. And I mean, it's an interesting extension to think about, uh, but uh, yeah, it's too complicated in, in this stage. Um, 
it, it's, it's a fair point to make when we think about the high degree of agglomeration in Japan. There are a lot of information spillover on the supply side and the buy side, but we extract from that kind of analysis at this point. Any more questions? All right, so you know, let's sort of talk about uh, the firm, what kind of decisions a buyer has to make. Uh, first, the buyer has to make decisions about where to source the input. Uh, conditional on finding a good supplier, uh, uh, the firm will have to invest in communication with that low-cost supplier uh, you know, from potentially any region. And finally, after the shipment of intermediates, then the firm is going to choose prices to maximize profit. All right, so there are basically three uh, sets of decisions that the firm has to make. So why isn't the first decision and the third decision basically the same? Because distance affects the cost of investing, so that's just going to be built into my ex-ante sourcing decision. There's only two decisions. Do I go to the region to source, and then who's the best guy once I get there? Yeah, we, you know, Taiji and I talked about this, you know, whether to model communication of fixed costs uh, as a fixed cost or a variable cost. If it can be modeled as a fixed cost, which we have encountered some difficulties, then, uh, you know, your comment is exactly correct. That, you know, you invest in some fixed cost, find a supplier, build a relationship, and then the rest is basically just... So, so let me just be clear. In, in my model, um, or the model in my paper, let's be humble, um, <laughs> which is just Paul's model, um, um, the marginal and fixed cost of the region end up being uh, showing up everywhere basically together. So they're going to show up everywhere together for you too. So I don't understand, I, I don't understand the response. It seems like there's one, you know that a more distant region is going to potentially be you know, have a higher fix, maybe have a higher fixed cost of finding, it's going to have a higher iceberg cost of getting the good, and it's going to have a higher uh, marginal cost of training the guy. It's all just going to be bundled together. There's no, there's no separation there. Yeah, so uh, wait for a slide, and maybe that will be clear. Um, the first part is exactly like your model, right? You know, firms pay a fixed cost final region. Of course, there's some rational expectation of, you know, if I use someone from Hokkaido, which is the northern part of Japan, then I probably have to invest, you know, a lot more to communicate with that guy. They don't know the cost? They know the, they expect the cost, right, with rational expectation, right? So you can think of that as another iceberg cost, but this one is endogenous, conditional on how much you optimally choose as communication investment. All right, so it will be, it may be clearer. Uh, I don't guarantee, but it may be clearer in two slides. Uh, so thanks to the Eaton Cotton, we are able to write uh, the equation for the share of insourcing uh, to region R in sector K as this, where phi is something called sourcing capability, uh, as uh, uh, emphasized by uh, Paul. Uh, and there's a part for insourcing. I mean, it is possible that the firm is so unproductive that it doesn't see outsourcing as a profitable strategy because there's some fixed cost of outsourcing that, you know, all the stuff are basically produced in-house. It's not the case in our data because our data is by supply network, so everyone is outsourcing something in our data set. And there's a part which is uh, the summation of all this fee, which is sector and region specific. Uh, to fix idea, you know, the fee part for uh, insourcing thanks to Ethan and Colton is simply as a function of T, which is Oh, shape parameter and then theta, which is another shape parameter to determine, uh, uh, you know, how much you are going to insource uh, uh, in your location. Maybe you are productive in, in Tokyo, so, you know, you do a lot of stuff by yourself, but if you are not, then you probably have to rely on suppliers. And this is a part that hopefully uh, answers some of Andy's uh, questions. Um, there are N potential suppliers in region R sector K. The first part is going to be Ethan Cotton creation again, there's this part which is Q, that will affect, you know, the successful delivery of the goods. Um, you know, it's a continuum and, you know, due to law of large number, you can just say this is how much goods you are going to receive, or you can think of that as sort of quality of goods if you don't like the probability concept. This is a part about iceberg trade cost, and there's this part which is A times Q. Q is going to be chosen by the buyer, and that is going to be affected by distance, right? So, you know, if you take all this fee uh, uh, as given, and firms are going to optimally choose the amount of investment in sector K for 
you know, any buyer and the buyer is going to have the identity with the distance from you as a buyer. As a function beautifully uh, as uh, in terms of row, uh, which is the elasticity of substitution between different input varieties in sector K. And obviously it depends negatively on distance, right? So if you are trading with a guy that is far away, you're not gonna invest as much as, as communication. So Rho intuitively captures the idea that, you know, how likely you're able to buy something by the same intermediate input from someone else, right? It's highly substitutable that, you know, you don't really need to buy from a particular guy, but if Rho is low, you are going to invest a lot in communication. And at the same time, that will encourage you to basically buy from nearby suppliers, right? So we have this sort of second derivative highlighting the interaction between uh, specificity as proxy by row, something that we can measure in the data, and also the distance between the buyer and the supplier. All right, so it seems that I only have 10 minutes. Uh, let me uh, move to the empirical results. Uh, just to highlight uh, what we find in addition to what uh, Andy and Paul find in the paper, uh, offshoring is more likely uh, for more productive firms, especially for generic inputs, uh, offshoring is going to uh, 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 increase the geographic scope of outsourcing uh, within an industry. Uh, and offering, offshoring is going to cause this buyer to drop the least productive suppliers in all the regions, right? So imagine in each region you have a distribution of suppliers and then you cut sort of the left tail of the distribution. Offshoring is going to reduce insourcing, right? Because now the firm appears to be more productive, so therefore it can go outside the firm boundary and find some suppliers uh, somewhere else. Uh, the data set, which is all use, also used by Bernard and others, uh, is provided by a credit rating agency in Japan. It's called Tokyo Shoko Research Institute. Uh, we have two years of data. This data set is extremely expensive. Uh, you know, my research budget will not be able to afford that. Uh, but the information that we can get is great. You know, we know the size of the firm in terms of sales and employment, the location, some information about the uh, industry code, uh, and also the number of factories that the firm has, right? So in some sense, if we push the project forward, we can actually think more about insourcing versus outsourcing. Um, uh, there's some sort of top code for how many suppliers and buyers that a firm uh, need to report. Uh, uh, firms are encouraged to report up to 24 suppliers and buyers. Uh, for big firms, it's not surprising that you know, all of them are top coded. You know, they report a lot of buyers and suppliers. So you may be worried that you know, now we are only looking at a small uh, subset of the network, uh, but you know, we actually can use information provided by both the buyers and suppliers to extend the coverage of the network, right? Uh, suppose, you know, Paul said, you know, I'm the supplier of him, uh, and I didn't report him as my buyer, but you know, based on his information, then you know, we can create an additional link. Uh, so as a result, um, let me skip this. Uh, as a result, you, we are able to create a data set uh, with uh, 4.5 million observations, uh, meaning uh, buy and seller links for 2010. Uh, the mean number of sellers per buyer is about 5.5, and the median number of sellers per buyer is about three. All right. Uh, when we look at offshoring or global sourcing, we have to mer merge this data set with you know, trade data sets. Unfortunately, the trade data set focuses on medium and large firms, so the sample size drops substantially. And at the end, you know, there is a very specific set of regressions that we only use manufacturing buyers that potentially trade with foreign countries, and the number of links drop to around you know, 200,000. Uh, in case you're worried about this sort of truncation or sample selection problem due to merging, uh, you know, the sort of overall uh, pattern uh, uh, of uh, you know, number of connections and the fraction of firms that uh, uh, have a lot of connections, somehow follow, you know, for a large range, uh, the ZIF law, right? This is true for the overall sample before merging, which is captured by the dotted line, uh, but the, for the solid lines, you know, that is basically the distribution or the sort of size rank uh, uh, plot uh, uh, for our restricted sample. Okay, uh, so, uh, you know, we ran a bunch of regressions that, uh, you know, test some specific prepositions of the model, but you know, put it this way, they also verify or confirm uh, findings by Bernard and others. Uh, first, uh, you know, uh, larger buyers are going to source uh, from more suppliers, uh, and they're also going to source uh, to uh, more regions in Japan, captured either by cities, number of cities, or number of prefectures. 
Um, and uh, surprisingly, uh, this is something that is uh, slightly different from Belgium, uh, agglomeration is huge, meaning that you, know, you see half a million uh, links that are basically established within five kilometer uh, of the firm. All right, so you know, those of you who have been to Tokyo, you should not be surprised about this fact. You know, it's a country with a lot of densities. Um, you know, localization was already a fact in Japan, maybe because of this requirements of face-to-face -face interaction that is important, uh, but there may be many other reasons. What we are trying to highlight is after offshoring, this localization appears to be even, uh, 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 even more uh, intense. How much time do I have, Color? Seven, so we have a 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first set of results about specificity uh, is the following. So we regressed the log number of sellers per buyer uh, at the buyer level or at the buyer sector level, right? When I say sector, I mean input, input sector. So in the first row, not surprisingly, we find a negative relationship between the distance between buyer and the location. Uh, and uh, the number of sellers that the buyer use from that location. But more importantly, there is some sort of strengthening effects for uh, relation-specific industries, right? relation-specific intermediate inputs, uh, uh, which is captured by uh, you know, the negative sign on the interaction time between uh, the specificity measure of the input. And we use uh, several measures for specificity. Our preferred measure is, of course, something that is proposed by our model, which is one over row, right? So, you know, how substitutable the inputs are from the perspective of the buyer. And that is measured using Broda and Weinstein at the industry level, obviously. And we include final goods, and we restrict ourselves to look at only intermediate inputs. Uh, the results are robust. Yeah. True, but uh, we can merge the Broda and Weinstein with the list of intermediate inputs constructed by United Nations uh, BEC and argue that the demand for those stuff are probably going to be by firms, not by final good consumers. Yeah, but again, it's not, it's not uh, Chilean widgets against French widgets, right? It's widgets again, you know, with other types of inputs in production. That's what you're interested in. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm interested in the substitution within the narrowly defined industry, right? So it's not across industries. I mean, I should be, if I can, I want to measure that as well, but in the model, we assume it's just a complex aggregate. My assumption is elasticity equal to one. They're, they're doing 10 digits, though, right? Right. And that's surely too disaggregated for what you have in mind. Yes, but the beauty of the 10 digit information is I can aggregate to any levels I want. I mean, you know, I run regressions at HS6, HS4. Um, but we can talk more about this. Yeah, well, so, I thought you so used the same stuff in your recent paper with Laura and Holler, right? Yeah, exactly. I think we do the same in our own robustness check when we do pro minus alpha. But we use an input output table, and we do things more aggregated. Yeah, so I'm not but we are still relying for alpha and looking at the so I think we're a bit uh, subject, but let's discuss this later over a coffee. I mean, I know you have we, reservation yeah, about how to measure alpha in your paper, but you know, I take the robustness chart in your paper and use it here. Yeah. <laughs> so let's move on. Then it's great. Yeah, okay, <laughs> but if you if yeah, if you don't like it, then you know, use the route index and use the measure uh, provided by Bernard and co-authors. You know, which is the share of intermediation. In different industry in the U.S., you know, we got the same results, right? The idea is, you know, if there's intensity of intermediation, meaning you buy stuff from an intermediary is higher in the U.S., probably those kind of goods are also more generic, right? So, uh, so the existing industry standard measures uh, will also give us the results. Um, in the last three columns, uh, I show uh, that uh, more productive firms are more likely to outsource a specific input, uh, con you know, uh, you know with the, uh, knowing that, you know, you have to pay extra communication costs to outsource, then, you know, if you're productive, that helps. Uh, this is a table showing you that conditional on outsourcing, how likely that the firm will import uh, the same intermediate input, all right? Uh, so 
just to be honest, you know, we don't have highly disaggregated information about uh, import. We basically have sort of like HS two digit import at the firm level, uh, but that doesn't prohibit us from running the regressions. And of course, we have to aggregate the specificity measure from you know four or six digit to the H digit uh, to run the regressions. You only have nine sectors. Right? It's not HS two. Twelve. Okay. Yeah. So it's aggregate of HS two. Oh, fine. Okay, uh, child sectors, thanks for catching it. Uh, and uh, more productive firms are more likely to offshore. Uh, you know, sometimes it's significant, insignificant, but you know, if you look at uh, the red highlighted stuff, it means that uh, they are less likely to uh, offshore uh, specific input conditional on outsourcing, right? Again, you know, we are not looking at outsourcing and offshoring at the same time, but we should. Uh, this is a very uh, truncated sample. Uh, next, I'm going to show you some results about the effects of offshoring on firm performance as well as uh, choices of domestic suppliers in Japan. Uh, what, remember, we only have two years of data, so we are going to take the long difference uh, for each firm uh, between 05 and 2010 uh, to look at how offshoring uh, will affect the firm's the bias, sales, labor productivity, and also the scope of outsourcing. And this is uh, my favorite table, although you know, I debated a lot with uh, uh, Taiji uh, about how to interpret that. Uh, first of all, not surprisingly, uh, if the firm was not importing in 2005 and start importing from 2005 to 2010, we don't know which year the firm started importing, but you know, probably doesn't matter if we are not interested about sort of the, the age effects of importing. Uh, we find that importing in any industries is going to increase uh, sales of the buyer, uh, uh, which is a lot difference, remember, uh, and it will also increase labor productivity of the buyer. And uh, in terms of domestic, the scope of domestic outsourcing, we find that uh, on the net, uh, the firm after offshoring is going to drop suppliers in Japan. They will also you know, reduce the scope of outsourcing in terms of number of sectors that they outsource domestically, and also the number of regions that they will outsource domestically. Uh, the last column shows you uh, the average distance of domestic outsourcing is going to be reduced after off offshoring. Uh, once again, this is a set of manufacturing firms that either participate in imports uh, uh, as a continuous importer or as a new importer. All right, so the number of observations is not huge uh, as you may want to have. Uh, the last set of tables, I'm going to show you how importing affects add and drop uh, uh, probability of uh, suppliers. I know I'm running out of time, but I really want to talk about the instrument. Uh, you get the results already, uh, which is the instrument is actually inspired by two set of literature. Uh, the first set is you know this set of famous paper by Alter Don and Hansen, talking about you know how China affects the you know, labor market experience in the U.S. Uh, we are not focusing on the on China. You know we take into account all possible uh, export uh, uh, countries in the world and how the uh, increase in export supply will affect the probability of Japanese uh, imports or offshoring, right? Uh, so if you take any kind of model that has variety in it, uh, the log export from country C to country J, uh, country C to country K in sector J, uh, minus the corresponding measure for Japan is going to take this form, where A basically captures productivity uh, of the country in that sector, and also there's some tau which captures broadly any kind of trade costs that affect trade from that country in that sector. So in that sense, we allow Japanese firms to outsource due to uh, you know, decreasing trade costs, which has been emphasized by global value chain researchers, but also increasing export capability, notably China, but we also allow other countries to take the same role as uh, Chinese firms. And then we uh, run the regression for the empirical counterparts, you know, with the left-hand side being the log difference relative to Japanese exports in the same sector, controlling for industry and destination country fixed effect. We take the residual, we look at the change in the residual at the country pair, uh, at the country sector level, and then we average out the change in the residual across destination countries as the measure of the supply shock from the exporting country. All right. So this is the second step. And finally, because we want to look at you know, how export supply affects firms' probability of outsourcing, offshoring, uh, then we have to weight the 
uh, export supply shock at the country level back to the industry level, and this relies on Japanese country level import patterns from different countries and different sectors. We are not done yet, right? You know, now we have an industry specific instrument, but how can we turn the industry specific instrument to a firm one? Thanks to the uh, domestic production network data sets, you know, we know what inputs the firm has been outsourcing domestically. So we multiply that dummy with the corresponding industry shock to allow that instrument to vary across firms within an industry. All right. So I've been talking to a lot of people. It seems to be very difficult to find uh, firm-specific instruments for offshoring. Uh, you know, we may be lucky to have the right data set to do it, but you know, we check the robustness and everything. It seems that the first stage is extremely strong. So with the two SLS, we find that, as I said earlier, uh, offshoring is going to induce firms to add and drop. Uh, the dropping part is probably more difficult to explain, but the adding part uh, is uh, highlighted by the model. Uh, in particular, uh, firms are likely to add bigger suppliers, but at the same time, they're also likely to drop bigger suppliers and more distant suppliers. Right? So this is a part that cannot be easily explained by the standard sort of productivity and distance trade-off uh, in this literature. So the next or the final set of results is uh, we look at the interaction between the import instrumented import dummy for the buyer and how that will affect the outsourcing decisions in the domestic economy at the sector level. And we find that uh, firms after offshoring are more likely to add specific inputs in the domestic economy. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, little uh, results on the, on the dropping side, but, you know, we are still sort of pushing this table forward. I'm negative two minutes behind, uh, so let me conclude. Uh, I think uh, it's nice, uh, as confirmed by Andy yesterday, that, you know, someone should look at the interaction between foreign and domestic outsourcing using firm level data. Um, and, you know, the model, you know, provides sort of the standard prediction about productivity and distance and how they interact in shaping uh, the production network. But we highlight this sector specific dimension, which may lead to increasing agglomeration or regionalization of trade. Uh, so there's still a lot of stuff that we want to do. The next stage is to take the structural parameters more seriously and perhaps, you know, do some structural estimation about, you know, how rho and theta and all this will affect the outsourcing uh, patterns in particular in what situation that offshoring may be complement, may be substitute for domestic outsourcing. Uh, we haven't talked about the aggregate effect of offshoring, um, and this is a place where sort of macroeconomic research uh, uh, is important to think about, you know, how restructuring of a domestic production network due to efficiency gains as a result of offshoring will lead to a higher productivity uh, of the entire country. Okay, since we are running a bit uh, late, so let's maybe go for coffee and continue, I'm sure, discussion over there. So thank you. Let's resume at the uh, top. So, thanks to Heiwei. And let's resume on time uh, for Joel, and that's going to be 11.10.